Now, uh, there had to be a, a tremendous increase in spending over the 19th century, but it was outstripped uh, by an even greater uh, increase in production and supply. Could anyone think of any uh, factor that we've been dealing with on and off uh, that could explain uh, the very significant fall in prices in the 19th century and their uh, more profound rise in the 20th century? Well, the Industrial Revolution actually started in the late 18th century, and you could say it was uh, continuing perhaps through the 19th century, and has further continued now up to the present time. The automation uh, machinery that's increasing the production and supply of things, and how does how do increases in production and supply operate on prices, other things being equal? They make prices go down. Yes, uh, Mr. Weatherford? More debt. If that would make prices go up? Well, uh, 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 think of that. Uh, what is the amount of money that can be borrowed depend on? Uh, the amount of money that exists. Uh, if you have an economy uh, with a, a limited money supply, well, that will operate to limit how much money can be lent and borrowed. Uh, yeah. Well, then what would be the essential thing? The, uh, the money supply or the derivative, the amount of borrowing? I think the essential answer is uh, a major difference uh, in the rate of growth in the, well, in the first instance in the volume of spending. But uh, the volume of spending itself depends on the quantity of money. Uh, where you have a limited increase in the volume of spending, that's because there's a limited increase in the quantity of money. Where you have a vast increase in spending, it's because the foundation is there in terms of a vast increase in the quantity of money. Well, what's the major difference with respect to money uh, between the 19th century and the 20th century uh, in the United States, Mr. Foster? I just keep okay, and Mr. Foster, I think it's implying that the increase in population may be the source of an increase in spending. Well, now let's look at that. If you have an increase in population, uh, more people want more things. Uh, uh, you look like you have an answer. What is your name, sir? Chris Corner. Chris Corner. Okay, Mr. Corner. No longer being on the gold standard. I would say that's the real answer. That in the 19th century, the country was on the gold standard. That very sharply limited the rate of increase in the quantity of money, only to the extent that new and additional gold could be mined, and also silver too, uh, could the quantity of money grow and the volume of spending. Uh, for most of the 20th century, there has been no such constraint, and even while there still was such a constraint, it was being weakened. Now, I, I think that is the fundamental. If we didn't have the growth in money, it's true there'd be more people around if we have population growth, and they'd like more collectively, but uh, how, do they, how do people have to get the money to spend? They need to produce, they need to get a job, right? right? Now, if you have more people and they're entering the labor market to find a job, uh, what is the effect of more workers on wage rates? They will operate to decrease wage rates. Now, uh, if we have uh, some increase in the quantity of money, uh, uh, to take uh, some hypothetical numbers, Suppose over the 19th century, uh, the volume of production increased by 10 and the quantity of money increased by 5. Uh, that would explain uh, a uh, crisis falling in half. Uh, if the population uh, did not increase uh, that rapidly, so the population really doubled. Uh, assume that to go with our other assumptions. 
suppose we have uh, five times the uh, money, uh, five times the volume of spending, five times the total wages paid in the economy, uh, two, two times the number of workers competing uh, for jobs. What would be the effect on the average money wage? Five times the total wages paid, two times the workers competing for jobs. Higher. How much higher? Five, five over two, two and a half, right? Okay, now if there's five times the spending and ten times the output, the prices are half, right? Okay, and if money wages are two and a half and prices are half, uh, what does that imply about how much the average worker can buy? Five times more. Uh, you're earning four, two and a half, price to half, uh, so five times uh, the real wage. Uh, the, the increase in the supply of workers uh, limits the rise in wages. Uh, there's five times more spending, but that won't raise wages five times. If there's twice the number of workers, it raises wages two and a half times. Uh, but if there's ten times the output, five times the spending still goes with the uh, prices being half. Yes, Mr. Richard. What's the advent of the social welfare system in the 20th century? Was that something like the back of the 1950s or something like that? Would that increase prices? Would the uh, social welfare system increase prices? In the New Deal and everything like that? Uh, it's possible it could have a, a limited effect. Uh, imagine that uh, you suddenly establish a large scale uh, welfare system and uh, some significant number of people feel, well, now they don't need to work, uh, they'll go on welfare. Okay, if everything else were equal, if the total population is the same, uh, the quantity of money and the volume of spending are the same, but now we have uh, some percentage of the people withdrawing from the labor market, uh, what would that do uh, to the number of people working and producing? It would reduce it. Okay, wage rates would go up, but also, if there are fewer people working, and if the output per worker were unchanged, what would it be doing to the production and supply of consumer goods? That would go down. Uh, so uh, prices would be going up, too. And uh, who would be paying uh, the bulk of the, uh, of the cost for this welfare? The taxpayers, uh, many of whom are workers. So uh, their wages uh, go up, but out of the higher wages, they're paying taxes. And prices rise corresponding to the higher wages that they have. So they would have a loss. Now, this would account for a limited rise in prices, but do you think they could account uh, for any very sustained, repeated, cumulatively substantial rise? You see, in order to explain uh, prices rising because fewer people were working, how many fewer people would have to work? in order for prices to double. They have to have had the people working, having the production, that would double prices. But if, even if that happened, which I, I don't, don't think it could ever go that far, but even if such a thing happened, uh, suppose that uh, you had uh, uh, scientific and technological progress still going on, so the output of the half that were working was increasing. Uh, so you might have half the people working, but if the half who work were producing twice as much on average each, uh, then what happens to prices? They'd be the same. Uh, instead of doubling, they'd be the same. And uh, the effect of this sort of thing that reduces uh, production and supply, it would, be to make, it would be to make prices higher than they otherwise would have been, but it's almost impossible that they could account uh, for a progressive nature. Yeah. The problem in Germany is was a problem there because we have that full labor market. Yeah. They have a pretty strong, most of Europe has a strong social welfare system. Yeah. So is, that, is that the reason why the prices seem to be higher? Well, the American going to Germany? Uh, I would say that it's probably a factor for prices being higher uh, to the extent they have uh, the value added tax. Uh, I know uh, their tax system explains the sharply higher price of gasoline, retail gasoline in Europe. Uh, but it would not explain uh, any disparity in the annual rates at which prices rise. Uh, I would say the real wages, the standard of living in the United States is higher uh, than in Western Europe. And uh, I believe it's uh, 
uh, probably because we have a higher output per worker. Uh, the higher output per worker uh, gives a more favorable relationship between wage rates and prices. It makes prices lower relative to wages. Yes, uh, Mr. Weatherford. But doesn't that higher output per worker have a direct relationship back to both the social programs in the sense that employees know they're working yeah that would all enter uh, you see uh, just consider if, if that, you had two economies, would everything be equal, except in one, uh, the average worker works uh, 50, out, 50 weeks a year, and the other, he works 48 weeks a year. In one, uh, in the weeks in which he does work, he's working 40 hours a week, and the other, in the weeks in which he does work, he's working 35 hours a week. What would be implied about uh, production in these two economies, all other things being equal? Well, the production would be higher in the economy in which people work more, yeah. and to the extent the social welfare policies uh, induce people to work less or compel them to work less, uh, that would result in less production and higher prices. And uh, the, even though it, it, the reduction in hours worked, uh, reducing the supply of labor performed, uh, can raise nominal wage rates, it also raises prices correspondingly and out of the higher nominal wages, you're paying higher taxes. So the net balance is you're just stuck with higher prices. Yes, Mr. Um, Chairman. Do you think that uh, uh, production efficiency might have some contributions to the price order over time or the fluctuation of the price? Yeah, the improvements in efficiency. Uh, well, what do you guys think the effect of improvements in efficiency is on prices? Well, yeah. mm-hmm. but, uh, see, with greater efficiency, well, the first thing that's cut is the unit cost. And uh, a simple way to look at it, this is not a 100% perfect uh, method, but uh, the overwhelming element of cost is labor cost. And now, when costs are cut, uh, almost always it will mean lower labor cost. Even when you uh, switch uh, from a more expensive to a less expensive material, say. Suppose the cost cut to you appears as uh, you're now using a less expensive material. Well, uh, what would be the main element explaining why one material is less expensive than another? Uh, that it probably takes less labor to produce. Now, to the extent we succeed in producing things with less labor, where does the labor that we no longer need to produce those given things, but where will that go? It will produce more of other things or larger quantities of those things. So as you save labor, uh, that uh, amounts to increase in production. Uh, think about this for a moment, and I think we uh, dealt with this somewhat last week. Uh, we've had tremendous uh, improvements in efficiency over the last 200 years. Uh, the average unit of labor, it probably takes a small fraction of the labor today to produce practically anything that it used to take. Now, uh, do these labor-saving improvements uh, result in, in unemployment uh, on a long-term economy-wide basis? We cut the quantity of labor required to produce practically everything, a uh, major multiple. The unemployment rate is not significantly different. Uh, what has the uh, saving of uh, unit labor uh, shown up as? Yeah, if we produce the average good with one one hundred for labor today, well, that explains why we're producing a hundred times more per capita. And what does that do uh, to prices? Other things being equal, that operates to reduce them correspondingly. Uh, prices would have fallen incredibly. Uh, why have prices risen instead of falling, even though we've had this tremendous rise in production? because there's still more rapid increase in the quantity of money. And what is it that allows the increase in the quantity of money uh, and thus the volume of spending so regularly and consistently to outstrip the increase in production and supply? Mm-hmm. 
What is it about the monetary units that permits this? There's no gold standard. Well, there's no gold standard. The, the, the monetary unit that we have is something that has virtually zero cost to produce and nothing limits the quantity. So we shouldn't be surprised that its value keeps declining. Now, this is a very unfair rate. So what underlies the increase in production and supply? What factors underlie uh, the increase in production and supply, above all, per capita? What do you mean the amount of money spent? <coughs> well, now, there's labor. Uh, uh, well, there's the amount of labor, but uh, that wouldn't r relate so much on a per capita basis. Why is it that we produce so much more per capita today than 100 years ago and 200 years ago? Greater efficiency, technological progress, science and invention, saving and investment. Uh, we have uh, new processes developed, new products, uh, new uh, types of capital goods that implement the uh, technological advances. And uh, why do we have that? Who's responsible for that? Is, is that something that just happens? Yeah. Private enterprise and uh, individual uh, businessmen and capitalists are looking to make a profit. Uh, the basic way that you make a profit, if you don't have uh, the legislature bribes and in your pocket, uh, the, the way you have to make a profit in a free economy is you have to produce uh, improved products or produce uh, existing products more efficiently. That's the basic way. And uh, as we produce any given product more efficiently, that uh, releases the labor to produce more either of that product or of other products. And the, this is the driving force of the increase in production and supply. Now, uh, there are lots of people, I'm sure uh, every successful firm has some uh, nucleus of people, maybe you're part of them uh, at, at the firms you're working at. And we're literally uh, staying up late at night uh, thinking about how they could improve uh, what their company is doing. And they're devoting long, hard hours uh, to improving the products and methods of production. And these people are trying as hard as they can uh, throughout the year, uh, maybe collectively on an average, they might succeed in increasing the supply of things 3 4% at most. That would be a very good number today. So that's uh, the product of their best efforts, the best, most conscientious efforts. How easy is it to increase the quantity of irredeemable paper money at a more rapid rate? There's no problem at all. See, there's a very unequal race. On the one side, uh, the scientists, inventors, uh, the businessmen and capitalists, uh, with their best efforts, working as hard and as conscientiously as they can, in a good year, they can increase the production and supply of things 3 or 4%. On the other side, the expansion in the quantity of irredeemable paper money, without any difficulty, can proceed at 6, 8, 10%, or even much more. So what outcome would you expect? The prices that should be rising. It would be astonishing if you keep all of this in mind uh, that prices would not keep rising. Yes, Mr. Wright. I don't want to address it. What do you think if we have the gold standard as a corner person? The time value of money is going to be irrelevant. There would be an inflation, if you can grab inflation, because money could either gain value or lose value. Would that corner then be erroneous? The time value of money? For example, future value. Well, pardon me? People would still rather have money now than <laughs> Yeah, there would still be a time value of money, but what would be true is uh, the time, the, the rate of return that they would require uh, would be lower. See, the more rapid expansion in the quantity of money means systematically that uh, later on, when it's time to sell, there's more money out there than when you spent the money uh, to bring in the sales. Uh, so you just think, uh, suppose you constructed a factory in 1980. Okay, uh, and that factory will uh, be producing, let's say, until 2020. All right, now, uh, if the uh, quantity of money and volume of spending uh, between 1980 and 2020 are increasing at one rate, uh, 
That means that there will be some effect, there will likely be some effect on your sales revenues. Uh, if the quantity of money and volume of spending are increasing at a more rapid rate over that period, what should be the effect on your sales revenues from year to year? Or should they tend to be larger from year to year? Okay, what does that imply about the spread between uh, the cash flow that you're taking in uh, in each year uh, compared with uh, the fraction of your initial outlay? By me? So you have greater cash flow. So if in 1980 uh, you spent a million dollars on a piece of plant for the 40 year life, so you can think of that as there's 40 parcels of $25,000 each. 40 times 25,000 is a million. And each of those 25,000 will be paired against some future revenue. Now, if uh, the uh, flow of revenue is growing modestly, because the uh, quantity of money and volume of spending are growing modestly, well then, uh, the spread will be relatively modest. The more rapidly money and spending grow, what's happening to the size of that spread? It's larger, so uh, that introduces a systematic rise in uh, the, the rate of return uh, in the time value of money, as it were. Uh, at the same time, uh, what is it doing to prices? It's raising prices, so you have higher nominal profits, higher nominal interest, but it doesn't mean that you're really any better off. Because what you're gaining in higher profits, you're losing back in higher prices and you very well may not be able to replace the assets you bought, but that's a subject for the end of the term. Yes, uh, Mr. Wright. Uh, well, uh, on top of all that, you just said that monopolies are illegal. So not, if you have a monopoly, right, you, you could uh, keep the system, essentially, if you have, like, you know, in, in elastic demand, ideally, and then, you know, that doesn't matter what, what, how much money they're making, because, you know, like, you know, people need to buy your products. Or your product or service, your good yeah. service. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what the, your point is, but. Well, that, that way it wouldn't matter. Like, how much money they were producing because people would still demand your product. Yeah, but you see, uh, it does relate uh, to what you're thinking of as monopolies. Uh, uh, everyone who holds a copyright has a, what you can think of as a legal monopoly. Uh, so, the publisher of every copyrighted book. Uh, legally can ask any price he wants or a piece of music or whatever. Uh, what has to be present uh, for uh, uh, people in such a protected position uh, to raise their prices from year to year? What has to happen to the demand? It has to be rising. Now you see, uh, suppose uh, there's something that people may have a desperate need for or whatever. Uh, why Why wouldn't you just raise, uh, ask that best price immediately? What are you waiting for? Well, if, the, if you're waiting for increase in demand. Okay, but then that brings us to the question, what underlies any kind of systematic increase in demand? Well, you see, customer preference. Uh, you could have an increase in the demand for any given product if the customers decide, well, now they like your product, rather than other products. That could uh, enable you to raise your price, perhaps. But what does that imply about the demand for those other products? They, that's decreased, right? Now, what would be, what would be the effect of that on uh, the prices of these other products? They would tend to go down. Now, if what we're observing is that uh, you're able to raise your prices every year, uh, and uh, there's no great pressure for anyone to lower his prices, in fact, almost everybody is raising his prices, uh, what has to be the explanation? The, the overall demand, the aggregate demand is rising. Uh, that enables prices to go up every year. You see, even, even protected legal monopolists, what's true about them is they want to ask a higher price than would prevail under open competition. But that doesn't mean that they want to ask a continually rising price. Uh, they would want to ask their best price as soon as possible. And then you have to ask, why don't they ask a still higher price? What limits the price that even a protected legal monopolist asks? 
and there comes to a point when uh, the quantity sold will fall off too sharply, so that's as high as you can go. Now, what has to happen to enable you to raise that price the next year? The demand has to grow. The demand has to grow. Now, the demand might grow because other prices are falling. Now, if other prices are falling, is the foundation uh, for the rise in demand for what you have, because it gives people more disposable income, well, that's not a problem of systematically rising prices. If other prices are not falling and the demand for your product is rising, if the total aggregate demand is rising, then the explanation is an increase in the quantity of money. Yes, uh, Mr. Terry. I have a question. Production increases. very yeah. So that brings up the department and our houses. The outsourcing argument. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right to say that it casts doubt on the uh, fear of outsourcing because uh, uh, it may be suggesting uh, how would this differ uh, from importing a machine uh, from one of these places and uh, producing kind of fraction of the cost that way. But uh, I think there's another way to look at this problem. Uh, suppose we have a, a situation uh, someone has been making $100,000 doing something each year, and now that same job is realized can be performed at $20,000 if it's sourced out uh, to, uh, to India. All right, now, uh, this person who had been earning 100000 he's not suddenly going to uh, work for, for 20000 right? Uh, he won't have a job at 100000 but he'll have uh, some other kind of job, maybe at fifty or $60,000, uh, his uh, earnings will not fall to the same degree as the reduction in cost. Right now, uh, this may be a, a very bad situation for this person, uh, but his earnings have sharply fallen, and the improvement in what he buys is very, very tiny, because uh, it's just as one uh, small item. But what is the effect on the standard of living of all the other wage earnings in the economy? of this particular act of outsourcing. That goes up. All right, now, let's try to generalize it. Uh, let's imagine that in the whole economy, uh, there are uh, 100 different jobs, only 100 different jobs. And assume that uh, initially, uh, everyone is earning, we'll say, $100,000. And now, uh, pretty much everybody's job can be outsourced for $10,000. But there are still other jobs that will appear that uh, people can do uh, for $50,000. All right, what would be implied about the prices of the things we were getting? Uh, you see, we could be competitive uh, in meeting the competition of people who can do the job at $10,000 if we were willing to take an income of $10,000. But we don't have to. Uh, there's still much, much better jobs than that available. Uh, what is the effect on the cost of what we'd be buying uh, if we have widespread outsourcing? Suppose all the workers are getting uh, half the money income, but the prices of the things they're buying are 10% of what they used to be. Pardon me? They're better off in real terms, but the substantial improvement. Because while well, their earnings might have fallen, they would not fall to the extent that costs are cut and prices reduced. Yeah. They have more money to sell them Pardon me? They have more money now to sell them other things. Yeah, uh, that would be the point. Uh, there would be more things available to people. If uh, 
if uh, all of the things, for so many of the things that we now do, uh, could be done more cheaply outside the country, and we let that happen, well, then all of those things are cheaper. All of those things will be cheaper. But the people who used to do them will have uh, other, will find other jobs. And uh, even if uh, uh, the uh, wage level were to fall somewhat, uh, the implication is that prices would fall even further. Yes, uh, Mr. Coleman. Um, so long as you don't have a mortgage, but countrywide is not there. You only have to pay half of what we gave you. Okay, that's, that's a good uh, consideration. Uh, the, if there were a substantial fall in wage rates, uh, that would be difficult uh, for uh, people who have significant debts. That much is true. Yes, uh, in the back, uh, Mr. Rosenthal. Rosenthal. Okay, in line with what Chris was thinking about it, I think the outcomes against the crucial critical level of the 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 so that the business well, the 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 you're saying it's not a big effect on the general public, uh, would be a problem for Landon, but uh, to the extent there is an effect on the rest of the population, what is it? Mm -hmm. If it's just Landon's industry, well, it might be small, but is it negative or positive for the rest of the population? Would it have to be positive? Because here we are. We have a small minority of people doing the particular type of work in question, and the great majority are consumers, directly or indirectly, of that work. So, uh, if there's something that makes things uh, more difficult for a limited class of producers, but there's cheapening the product they produce, while it might, in some cases, be hard on the producers, it's got to benefit the consumers. But let me uh, say further uh, to address uh, Mr. Corman's observation. Uh, in practice, as time is going on, uh, what do you think is happening uh, to the demand for labor and wage rates? It's increasing, uh, so the outsourcing might uh, cut down on the rate of increase, so it would actually be unlikely that we would have a generalized uh, substantial declines in, uh, in nominal wage rates. Uh, what it would mean is that uh, prices, if they don't fall, at least would be rising significantly less than they otherwise would have been, and the relationship between the rise in prices and the rise in wages would be improved. Yes, Mr. Thompson. Uh, no one's exactly how long the cost of dollars are talking about the long term, but you can take any and that sort of an example. I didn't have the same time. Yeah. And when we first saw the house from the house of dedicated, we can see a computer program at right, ten thousand dollars and we look at them as a commodity, it is most definitely limited. So if we take, you know, if we employ five thousand, you know, computer programs that get ten thousand dollars at some point in time, when well, other companies start coming in and for them, their wages are gonna start going up. And all those are Ours have lower because we have to go to different industries at some point in time we're going to have to balance that. Yes, that's perfectly true. That's a very good observation. Uh, since there's a limited number of these uh, uh, people to do the outsourcing jobs, uh, as there's more demand to take advantage of it, it raises their wages, and as there's less demand uh, for all workers of the same kind, and their wages fall, uh, then uh, there's an equilibrium achieved, and uh, the competitive disadvantage comes to an end. So it's not the case that it goes on uh, forever without any limit. Yes, Mr. Collins. Yes, so what going for a little while, quite a while, three and a half people in India, and um, six specifically in software, but not in software, mm -hmm. and I compete against uh, England program, but it's also China and Russia are now doing the same thing. Right. There's years worth of uh, pick up labor over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So there'll be some fields, there'll be some fields that, that uh, we won't be able to perform uh, on any great basis for a while. 
Uh, but I would think in the nature of the case, the, here you are, you mentioned India has uh, over a billion people, and China even more than India. Now, uh, just think what must be the effect, uh, and, and in that population, we're basically as intelligent as we are, and if uh, they get integrated into the world economy, uh, what do you think is going to be the effect on uh, the amount of progress that is made and on the ability to produce? Uh, it's got to uh, mean a general improvement. Uh, if you have more intelligent people uh, working in the division of labor, uh, there's got to be more and better products, which would be a, an, an enormous force uh, for the good over this uh, century. Yes, Mr. Uh, Weather. On top of quote unquote India or China or Russia taking our job, it's easily likely that we will be selling them to in let's say money from overseas that right back to America. If their wages increase, their demand for consumer goods will go increase and their own company in the country support their own demand. It's more likely that we are going to provide I would think the, the net outcome of this would be that uh, there'll be a change in the pattern of specialization. There'll be some things that are done more predominantly in some of these foreign countries, and then there'll be other things that uh, will be concerned more with producing for them. Uh, that's always the effect. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Morris. As we create more jobs and outsourcing and because other countries, but we're also creating a new type of society in these countries too, where you usually have the very poor and the very rich. But now, because of the outsourcing, you are creating that middle class in countries that never had middle class. And then, on turn, what Bob was talking about, it creates more demand for what we're producing or what other uh, countries in the world are producing. Yeah, I would think that should, is what we should expect to be there. And then, um, one last part for you. Also, the people that lost their job before the outsourcing, they're also forced to go back and maybe increase their education levels to, to become more available in higher, higher positions in the economy. I think that's true also. And notice we have uh, these fears of outsourcing, but uh, how substantial is the unemployment rate? Uh, it's not very great by the historical standards. It hasn't. Uh, you know, they, they still have uh, humongous rates, but uh, the fear here is that uh, outsourcing to them will cause us to have the humongous rates. I don't think that's uh, justified. Yes, uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. Well, I'm sure it differs from case to case, and uh, Mr. Foster seems to know more about uh, the programmers aspect than I do. Uh, so maybe he's a better person to ask this, this particular question. Well, I'll give you an example in Siberia. A year ago, we can have a single programmer for $200 a month um, a per program. Right now, the rate is about $2,000 a month because there are so many companies that come in to offer software engineering. And they're all getting worse than they get bargaining. Yes, Mr. Chen. Um, do you see a possibility that uh, as a result of the outsourcing, uh, outsourcing um, might not drive the price lower in some instances? Uh, with outsourcing, not drive prices lower. A, a more general question, subsuming that, is uh, do cost cuts, might cost cuts, not drive prices lower? So, that's yeah, what outsourcing yeah, is doing. Um, um, uh -huh. I mean, that's, that's an incentive for a company to, you know, keep the price while their competitor is still, you know, uh, doing a lot of, uh, having a lot of labor to, you know, utilizing the same space, not outsourcing. So, okay. the company still the price of, Okay, um, if, if you'd ask the same question about any cost-cutting uh, improvement, uh, must it immediately uh, succeed in correspondingly reducing the price of the product in which the cost reduction occurs. 
No, it might not. Uh, suppose you have a uh, patented product, let's say, and the company producing it uh, succeeds in cutting the unit cost. And they decide that uh, there isn't any point in cutting the price of the product because there'll be virtually no increase in the quantity demanded. So keep the price of that product unchanged <laughs> and just make higher profits from the lower cost. That could happen. But if that does happen, the key question is, what do they do with the higher profits? Now, if they save and reinvest these higher profits, or even if they were to pay them as dividends and the recipients of the dividends saved and reinvested the higher profits, then uh, there is more money spent in production somewhere, not in that same industry, but in some other industry. And what will be the effect of that on production in the rest of the economy? It will go up, and if there's no expansion in the quantity of money and volume of spending, or it is whatever it is, it's not getting any greater than it would have been. Uh, if we now have more production and supply somewhere, uh, what must be the effect on prices somewhere else compared to what they would have been? Pardon me? Prices will be lower elsewhere than they otherwise would have been, and they have to be because there's a bigger production and supply of things somewhere. See, when uh, you succeed in cutting costs at point A, it doesn't mean that right away the price of, uh, at point A will go down. Maybe you'll have high profits for a time, but if those profits are saved and reinvested, there'll be more production and supply elsewhere in the economy, and there uh, prices and profits uh, will also decline. And now that you have a, a high profit in this particular industry, and there are somewhat lower profits in other industries, uh, what will be the competitive pressure? Uh, at some point, there's going to be more competition in this particular industry. At the most, it may have to wait till the patent comes off. Or other people will be attempting uh, to uh, work around the patent, uh, have an alternative process. Uh, there'll be powerful pressure. Uh, when costs are cut, uh, sooner or later, uh, prices are going to be cut. And if they're not cut where the cost cuts occur, uh, they're cut uh, pretty quickly somewhere else. So it, it seems to me that um, outsourcing, uh, I think the idea of outsourcing is, is essentially a good idea for the economy as a whole yeah. over a, a period of time. Yeah. Uh, it may not be you know, good for the individual labor of earners. But right. the it's, the same, it's the same as anything, really. Uh, suppose uh, we have a way we, we can produce more of some product using fewer people. Uh, the demand for the product is inelastic. Uh, the strongest case of that kind, I think, would be the production of table salt. Uh, no one is going to buy more table salt because the price is lower. Uh, what would happen if we could find a way uh, to produce table salt with half the labor? Uh, what would happen to the number of people employed in the production of table salt. It would end up being cut in half. Now, that could be very hard on those people, at least for a time. But what would be the effect of this on uh, the general standard of living? These people will find employment in producing more of something else. We don't want more table salt, but is there anything that we would not want more of? All kinds of things. Now, uh, they would find this employment, uh, it could occur very quickly, uh, provided the extra profits from the making of table salt were saved and invested somewhere, uh, then uh, that creates more job opportunities. But sooner or later, what will happen to the price of table salt? It'll decline, and when it declines, uh, people are getting the same table salt for half the money, and what do they do with the money they used to spend in buying table salt? They're buying other things. So uh, there's additional demand are created elsewhere. So the overall effect is we end up the same number of people are working, but fewer are working in producing that particular good, in this case table salt, and uh, they're producing more of other things. And they pay less for the table salt, they have the money left over to buy more of other things. But there is a detrimental effect on the society is that if, if a lot of companies that rather be also than else not be and so forth, is, then you have suddenly you have a pool of labor that kind of cars and you don't know where those labor could be shipped to 
elsewhere in a short period of time. Um, I mean, it could be in a, 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 a somewhat long period until that they find jobs, right? So there's a burden on society is that um, if, if, if a lot of companies start outsourcing rapidly, then unemployment rate will go up for a short period until those late, you know, those workers could find a system. Well, um, or a from that. Or um, until, um, yeah. So, so it, it is, it is not a good idea, in, you know, for a short term, but for a long term, the economy or the entire system itself will benefit from, from uh, Did you want to say anything? You are? Okay. As the prices, as the export jobs, as the prices of the company's equilibrium and the rates is kind of a common line, do you think those jobs are not to uh, the U.S. or wherever country do you think there's a cycle of life cycle for that? Well, uh, you see, I think that uh, as you uh, outsource or whatever, or uh, you substitute uh, imports for domestically produced goods, the outsourcing issue. I think is no different uh, than importing goods. Imagine you had people, uh, they've been producing things uh, for the domestic market, and uh, now the domestic consumers uh, decide they want to buy imports. So the people who've been producing those goods can no longer produce those goods. Well, uh, they will find alternative jobs, uh, and most likely in, in the export industry, or the, the equivalent of them will find jobs uh, in the export industry. Uh, the uh, more that we outsource or substitute imports for domestically produced goods, uh, the more we will expand in other areas. It's not going to be the case uh, that when something is done more efficiently, uh, there's no room uh, for the people who used to do a given type of work uh, to work. And I'd have to say, with outsourcing, I don't think that this is something that uh, could become a major short-term economy-wide issue. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, it can be a local. It can have, represent localized problems. Uh, you could address the question: uh, Suppose we had a monetary contraction. Suppose uh, there were a decrease in the volume of spending in the economy, as classically would occur in every recession or depression. Uh, what is it that then allows uh, people who are suddenly unemployed, uh, what would allow them, what did uh, again and again allow them uh, to find re-employment uh, on uh, terms that were profitable for the employers? Hmm. Well, in that case, uh, you would need a decline in money wage rates money wage rates. Then that reduces cost of production, makes it profitable uh, to sell products at lower prices. Now, I don't think uh, the outsourcing phenomenon uh, is uh, great enough uh, uh, to bring that about, uh, certainly in view of the things that are raising uh, the demand for labor. See, no outsourcing uh, can uh, move uh, the construction industry or uh, the transportation industry, or uh, retailing or wholesale. So uh, it applies uh, to a limited number of fields. Yes, Mr. Richard. Is that why um, British uh, transportation also noted the union has such a stronghold? Because they know their jobs to protect, they can't outsource those jobs to the fields? Well, now, you say, does this, um, he, uh, does this explain uh, the automotive unions, their jobs? Yeah, exactly. Well, their jobs, their jobs have been outsourced, only under a different name. You see, what is it that underlies uh, the great growth in imported automobiles? What's the connection between the unionization of the American automobile industry and uh, the import of automobiles? You see, the American automobiles are produced uh, at union wage scales for the most part, with union work rules, and uh, the difficulties of imposing higher quality standards uh, that the unions entail. So, uh, how does that connect with the volume of imports? See, the, unions, the unions have brought about a major outsourcing under another name, 
of automotive jobs. This, uh, what, you see, if, uh, if general, as far as general motor, you know, there's the phenomenon of the Monday morning car and the uh, maybe the Friday afternoon car. Now, uh, the automobile companies are not stupid. Uh, and they know what these problems are due to. I'm sure you do. Uh, suppose they, many of the uh, workers uh, come in, or even they don't come in Monday morning because they've had too big a weekend, or uh, they come in in a condition not able to do their job right. Okay, why can't the automobile company say, if you don't come in Monday morning ready to work and able to work, don't bother coming in at all? And there are other workers who could easily be trained to do those jobs, uh, who presently don't have such good jobs, uh, why don't the automobile companies simply do this and then they would eliminate the uh, Monday morning, Friday afternoon automobiles? Mm-hmm. They're dealing with the United Automobile Workers Union and they feel that the cost of a prolonged strike uh, would outweigh the benefits of uh, solving this problem. Now, imagine that uh, we had uh, uh, some of the labor laws repeal the laws of compelling the company uh, to bargain with a labor union. This is something we've had, I think, since 1935. We didn't always have it. I suppose it were abolished, and here there are other workers able to do the job just as well, and you don't have to employ the union workers. Well, what would happen uh, to the wage rates in that unionized industry? What would happen to the efficiency of production and the quality of the products? But the wage rates would go down, the efficiency would go up, the quality of the products would go up. How well would that do to the size of the domestic industry compared to the imports? The domestic industry would expand. Maybe it could become a net exporter again. And the same, I think, would happen in the steel industry and other industries. So uh, these are areas where uh, we have created a, a, an artificial competitive disadvantage. I'm sorry to put you off, Mr. Bernard. And the only thing that I thought uh, in the short term part, wages will drop. The other thing that happened in the mission is the long term, because we increase demand, these would be the Well, real wages would rise. You see what would happen? Uh, there'd be greater employment, and we'd reduce unemployment, we'd have uh, lower cost of production, lower prices, and better products. That would be the net effect. And we'll go into this a lot more. Pardon me? Well, the long run, in this case, would probably be on the order of a year or so. It would be, uh, that's relatively short, yeah. Now, we'll go into this in much greater detail, uh, probably in uh, three weeks, or four weeks. We'll have a lot to say about uh, the unemployment issue. Let me try to uh, pull things back on the track of the uh, quantity theory of money. Uh, I think you can explain uh, why uh, prices are rising from year to year. Uh, We have this very simple formula. If you conceive of the price level as formed by the ratio of the amount of money spent to buy things to the quantity of the things purchased, well, that gives you the explanation of rising prices. Uh, here, we have some more hypothetical figures. Uh, suppose, uh, from year to year, the spending to buy goods is increasing 6%. Uh, the quantity of goods produced and sold is increasing 3%. Well, what should you expect to happen to prices? What's uh, 1.06? Here we are. Uh, can you, I don't know if you can see up on the top here. Uh, plus C30 over D30. Well, uh, here's C30, 1.06, that's the increase in demand. Uh, here's uh, uh, D30, 1.03, the rate of increase in supply. But what happens if we have 1.06 to spending to buy 1.03 the quantity of goods and services? Then prices are up 3%. If we had 10% more spending to buy 3% more goods and services, prices would be up 7%. If we had 2% more spending to buy 3% more goods and services, prices would actually be down 1%. So it's the increase in money and spending that uh, is responsible for the rise in prices. Now, 
uh, just to uh, tie this down a little bit further, why does the increase in money explain the rise in spending? Well, think back first uh, to the conditions of uh, old Gabby Hayes, who if you stay up to maybe four in the morning, then you find a late, 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 late show. Um, I imagine an old uh, gold prospector uh, who strikes some gold, think back to the old west, let's say in this area, 150 years ago perhaps, uh, he finds some gold, and gold is the money of the time. Now, in effect, these, the gold he digs out of the ground will be manufactured into new and additional gold coins, and what will our men be doing uh, with these gold coins? He'll spend them. And what will the recipients of his spending do with those coins? They'll spend them. So these new and additional gold coins underlie a continuous rounds of spending and respending. What does it imply about the total amount being spent uh, given the foundation of this new and additional money? This greater spending. And now today, we don't have gold as money. Uh, we have irredeemable paper, but it's still the same principle. Suppose uh, the Treasury is running short of money. It wants to send out $1,001,000 Social Security checks, and it's short in its checking account. Well, they can easily get this money uh, from their friendly banker, the Federal Reserve System, and all they have to do is they send over uh, a billion dollars of Treasury securities. Uh, that gets locked in the vaults of the Federal Reserve System, and the Federal Reserve can credit the Treasury's uh, checking account by one billion dollars. The Treasury now has a billion dollars it didn't have. Where did it come from? Thin air. It was created out of thin air. Someone at the Federal Reserve uh, typed the, uh, the appropriate keys on a computer keyboard, uh, U.S. Treasury plus one billion dollars. Now the Treasury has a billion dollars and a million thousand dollars Social Security checks go out to various recipients. Okay, uh, let's imagine uh, that uh, they go into their banks, they cash the checks. The banks, as they're collecting these checks, will be uh, transporting them to the Federal Reserve Bank. The Federal Reserve Bank uh, will be honoring them by issuing the currency uh, from its vaults. The armored cars go to the banks uh, with piles of currency. Uh, the Social Security check recipients are walking out each with a thousand dollars. Okay, they'll be spending this money. What will the recipients do? They'll respend it. Now we can change the example. Uh, the recipients would assume have checking accounts, and uh, we could imagine uh, they spend their thousand dollars mainly by writing checks. Uh, they write checks to various people. What are the recipients of the checks do? They deposit them, and then uh, they can write their own checks. And they have further recipients. So the, the, what's common is uh, you have new and additional money, and on its foundation, the amount of money uh, that is spent is correspondingly increased. The, the new and additional pieces of money are spent and re-spent on each an item. The level of spending is higher. So uh, that is basically how the process works. Uh, the increase in money uh, leads to the increase in spending. Now, uh, as I said, uh, prices rise uh, because we have a monetary unit whose quantity can so easily be increased more rapidly than the supply of goods and services. It's the unequal race. Uh, the businessmen, scientists, and inventors struggling as hard as they can may increase production and supply on an average 3% a year, something like that. The quantity of irredeemable fiat money can be increased at rates that easily surpass that. And the result is rising prices. Now, uh, some further uh, significant evidence, a confirmation of uh, the fact that the problem is in the paper money uh, comes if we examine uh, uh, prices in terms of gold or silver. Now, what I have here on the bottom is a conventional $20 bill. Up on top is an actual size $20 gold coin, known as a double eagle. Uh, pardon me? 
Uh, you can buy them from coin dealers. Uh, Franklin Mint, I think there's an outfit in Newport Beach, or used to be, I don't know if they're still in existence, named Monix, Monix International. And there are coin dealers here and there in shopping centers. So uh, you can certainly buy them if you're interested. You could buy a bar of gold, too. Uh, they have kilogram bars. I guess they have smaller bars. Uh, but, well, if it's a kilogram, I think that's 32 ounces. Uh, a gold coin like this, a $20 gold coin, uh, contains a shade under an ounce of gold. Uh, 20.67. Uh, 20 over 20.67, I believe, is the gold content of one ounce. Now, uh, what's significant is, the, in the daily paper, you can find the price for gold bullion. I mean, what is the gold bullion content of a $20 gold piece? The, what's the gold bullion value of a $20 gold coin? If it contains roughly an ounce of gold, $400. The $20 gold coin that's stamped on its face, notice here, uh, $20. See right here, $20. Okay. Uh, prior to 1933, uh, a $20 gold coin and a $20 bill were interchangeable. Uh, whatever you could buy for the one, you could buy for the other. Just a shade under one ounce, uh, not quite one ounce. You see, the price of gold was twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents per ounce. So a twenty-dollar gold coin would be worth would have a physical gold content of twenty divided by twenty point sixty-seven. That's why it was worth twenty dollars rather than twenty dollars and sixty-seven cents. Okay, so now uh, today that same quantity of gold, which uh, prior to nineteen thirty-three was worth uh, just about twenty dollars, but uh, today it's worth uh, four hundred dollars, and then to rise beyond that. Now think of the implications of this for prices. Not very far from here uh, is one of my top favorite restaurants, uh, Ruth's Chris, and it's a simple matter if you have dinner with, uh, let's say, two couples have dinner, uh, you have a good bottle of wine, maybe a couple of drinks. I'm not supposed to say that here. <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be difficult with TIF uh, to have a bill of $400. Now, suppose uh, the law allowed uh, businessmen to accept a gold coin if they chose, uh, not merely at the face value of the coin, which is $20, and which the law would allow you to accept it as, but at the bullion value of the coin. Okay, then, uh, if uh, the management of Ruth Chris was willing to be paid that way, and I happen to have a $20 gold coin, uh, how much would my dinner cost in terms of gold dollars? One coin, a $20 gold coin. So here's this $400 dinner, which is uh, quite a few paper dollars, but uh, calculated in the gold coin, it's $20. Yes, uh, sir. Additional value based on the rarity of that coin outside of this $400 ounce price? Uh, the double eagle, uh, unless it's a special issue, uh, has a minimal premium. Uh, you could look at the price of gold. There are prices quoted, uh, certainly in Barron's and even the New York Times on the commodity page. Uh, you can see the price of leading gold coins. Uh, the gold coins uh, tend to uh, they're called bullion coins for good reason. Uh, their prices are typically within a couple of percent of the uh, bullion value. So uh, that isn't really uh, an issue. And uh, let me uh, try to pull up the document I had. Now, uh, think of the influence of this on prices. Look at the effect on price calculations. Uh, here we are. If the current price of gold is $400 an ounce, well, uh, a soft drink, uh, which today sells for 75 cents, uh, in terms of gold, uh, the price would be on the order of 4 cents. That's 120. 
Or maybe it's just it's simpler. Uh, well, the, the expense of meal, uh, I assume now in the table it here is three hundred dollars. I guess you could change that. That's what I should have had. Let's make that four hundred. Okay, that's uh, twenty dollars. Twenty gold dollars equals four hundred paper dollars. Uh, let's say we have a somewhat better car. Uh, for forty thousand uh, dollars in the gold coin, that would be two thousand dollars. Each uh, gold coin counts as four hundred dollars. Uh, so we have twenty dollars gold. That's four hundred uh, multiplied uh, by uh, ten, and you have four thousand uh, dollars multiplied uh, by uh, uh, ten more. Uh, you have uh, 40,000, and uh, we count out 100 gold coins, 100 gold coins each at $400. Well, that's $120 gold pieces that uh, buys the car. So the $40,000 car is $2,000 gold. Dollars. Uh, a $400,000 house would be $20,000. Now, uh, just imagine uh, if gold were, uh, had a bigger monetary employment, uh, what would that do to the demand for it, and what would that do to the price of gold? It would be higher, so the price of gold wouldn't be just $400. If it had a significant monetary role, it might be $800, $1,200, and prices expressed in gold would be that much lower. Now, even with the present prices, uh, if uh, merchants could legally discriminate between gold coins uh, compared to paper money. But they could say, yeah, it's true, uh, both units are stamped $20. But we're ready to take the $20 gold unit as the equivalent of $400 in paper. And uh, results would be similar, uh, though less pronounced, with the old silver coins. Uh, we had circulating silver coins until as recently as 1965. And uh, the current price of silver, I think, is in the neighborhood of $7 an ounce, uh, which means that an old dime uh, is worth about 50 cents. Uh, now, if merchants could discriminate, and you go shopping, and you see, here we are, uh, uh, some years ago, uh, at, at one time, uh, something cost a $10 bill or a roll of silver quarters. They were both equivalent. Or at one earlier time, something cost a $20 bill or a $20 gold coin. Now, the price in the paper money has jumped very, very substantially, but the price in the gold or silver coin uh, has not increased nearly so much, or maybe even has fallen. And people started having this day-to-day -day experience. They're going shopping, and they're saying, yeah, there's been a big run-up in prices, but the run-up has been overwhelmingly in the paper money, not the gold or silver coin. Well, how do you think that would affect the kind of money that people would want to be paid in? They'd want to have their debts payable to them in gold or silver. They'd want their pensions payable in such things. Uh, they'd want to uh, state long-term lease contracts in, such, in gold and silver. And what do you think that would do uh, to the price of gold and silver? Greatly increase it. And now, if uh, the paper continues uh, to depreciate while gold and silver held their value or increased their value, how would that affect the demand for paper money? Would people have a need for it? You see, that's why I say that in a free economy, uh, the paper money uh, would be replaced by gold and silver in much the same way as uh, in Panama and Ecuador and other places, uh, they want to replace their monies with the dollar. The dollar is better than their money, but gold is much better even than the dollar. And if we had free choice, I think that's what people would choose. Now, they don't get to make that choice because uh, merchants can't discriminate between the coins. That's against the law. Uh, you could pay your check at Ruth's Chris in gold coin if you were prepared to pay 20 $20 gold coins. In other words, uh, pay $8,000 worth of gold, which is why uh, the coins disappear.
So uh, this relates to the issue of would the establishment of a gold standard ever be possible? I would say all you would have to do is remove uh, the obstacles. Uh, it's not really necessary that the government do very much positive. But if it didn't stand in the way, uh, then uh, you, you, you have it come about. And that's the different story. You see, the investment value of gold uh, depends on uh, the prospects for inflation. If people believe that inflation uh, will uh, become stronger and maybe accelerate, uh, that will certainly raise gold. But uh, then it's very possible that the government will pull back, pull in its horns again, and uh, uh, cut the, the ground from under the market. That happened in uh, the early 80s. Uh, people thought the United States was about to go the way of Latin America, the prices would start rising uh, by double-digit rates or more every year. And so they were moving heavily into gold. That's why gold got to over $800. But then, uh, to the surprise of many, many people, and myself very much included, uh, they raised uh, short-term interest rates uh, to 22%. Uh, the uh, Federal Reserve discount rate, which I, I didn't get into tonight, but hopefully we'll next time, and uh, that uh, sharply cut back on the increase in the quantity of money. Uh, the Federal Reserve had uh, monetary growth targets, uh, sharply lower than they had been. Uh, they deliberately reduced the rate of increase in the quantity of money. And uh, this provoked uh, a temporary major recession. In 1982, uh, the unemployment rate temporarily got above 11%. But following that, uh, the rate of price increases dramatically fell. Uh, wage demands dramatically declined. It was common for a while uh, for people to be getting 8, 10, 12% salary increases each year. Uh, but when the uh, growth in money sharply declined, the growth in spending sharply declined, uh, the economy could not support this sort of price increase any longer. Uh, for a while it went on, but it resulted in major unemployment, and then the unions uh, greatly relaxed their demands. Uh, they had the phenomenon of givebacks. They had contracts entitling them to uh, wage increases equal to the rise in prices. Uh, they didn't insist on getting that. Because had they, uh, then uh, they would have caused more business failures and unemployment. So they gave that back. And uh, wage increases then sharply moderated. The rise in cost and prices greatly moderated. And uh, uh, then the unemployment rate uh, sharply fell. Okay. I think we covered a lot of ground. I hope you found this enlightening. I always think it's enlightening. And then I learned that many, many people... It, it doesn't register at all. <laughs> okay. See you all next week. Have a good week. Uh, I want to go into uh, further material in connection with money and banking. Um, I want to start by uh, backing up a bit uh, under the heading the origin and evolution of money and the contemporary monetary system. Uh, we sort of started that in the middle uh, with discussing uh, how the monetary system has evolved uh, since the Civil War, uh, what it is that uh, displaced the precious metals, uh, put them out of circulation, how we got to the kind of monetary system that we have today. Uh, but I think we need also uh, to have some understanding of how uh, money as such developed. If you stop to think about it, uh, everybody is uh, very eager to get hold of these things. We'd all like to earn more of them. You pass them around tonight? Yeah, I'm distributing a large supply. I have a bushel basket <laughs> outside. So, uh, why is it that everyone is so eager to get hold of this stuff? Because if you think about it, uh, what can you actually do with this uh, other than spend it? And the fact that you can spend it rests on the fact that uh, everyone else wants to take it from you. They'd like to have it too. Well, why do they want it? So they can spend it. But why? Uh, is this a, an infinite regress? 
that everyone is taking it because everyone else will take it? Well, is that satisfying that uh, there's something exists in effect because it exists and there's uh, no explanation? I mean, are people behaving in a kind of crazy way in uh, all being eager to take money? Because it, apart from uh, spending the money, uh, what can you do with it physically? Uh, can you eat it? You can burn it. You could burn it. Uh, does it make a uh, particularly good uh, fire? I wouldn't think so. Uh, you might also perhaps uh, try to use it as wallpaper, but it's uh, pretty ugly <laughs> as wallpaper. So uh, it really has no uh, physical commodity uses. Uh, it's essentially useless other than the fact that everyone is very happy uh, to accept it. But now we need to understand why is everybody happy to accept it? And saying, well, because everybody else is happy to accept it, that really won't do. Uh, and uh, what, what allows money to exist uh, is a uh, series of developments. Uh, nothing uh, could begin as money that did not have uh, other uses. Uh, nothing can ever start off as money uh, out, of, uh, out of the sky, in effect. Uh, for example, uh, there's a kind of money in the game, Monopoly. Uh, but do you think uh, that you could go and buy anything with Monopoly money? Why won't people uh, be willing to accept Monopoly money in exchange for goods and services? Well, you could say because they, nobody else is taking it. So why doesn't pe why don't people take monopoly money? Uh, why does everyone take uh, the uh, existing monies? Well, uh, there's actually a rational explanation, and that is, uh, money always originates as something out of something which was not money, out of something which had uh, ordinary physical type uses. Now, you could understand uh, why are people willing to accept bread, at least sometimes, in exchange uh, for things they're uh, offering. Because you can eat it. And it, it, it's not difficult to understand why people want to eat bread. It helps them stay alive. It nourishes them. So that's perfectly intelligible. Or why they might want to accept something like wine or cloth or the means of producing such things there, uh, you can see something that has physical uses that serve human needs or that uh, are usable in the production of such things. Uh, so there is some uh, intelligible tie to human life and well-being. Well, actually, money uh, originates on the foundation of things that have uh, physical uses. Money did not always exist. Uh, in uh, the early uh, days of, uh, of human beings and uh, for uh, probably many, many thousands or even tens of thousands of years, uh, there was no money. Uh, there was occasional barter transactions. Uh, members of some tribes might exchange uh, some of the things they possessed with members of other tribes. Uh, a little bit of division of labor might have developed. Uh, there were uh, exchanges going on here and there, and, uh, but no money yet. Uh, the way money originated uh, was out of uh, a foundation of barter, the physical exchange of useful goods against useful goods. And then uh, people saw very, very often that uh, while they might want something another party possessed, that other party perhaps did not want what they possessed and had available for exchange. Uh, this is a problem we referred to, uh, I guess, two weeks ago, uh, the lack of a double coincidence of wants. In order to have a barter exchange, in order, for example, to exchange eggs for shoes, the party who has the eggs has to value the shoes above the eggs he's offering. The party who has uh, the shoes simultaneously has to value the other's eggs above his shoes. You need uh, two parties with uh, opposite valuations, opposite comparative valuations of the two goods. So the owner of the eggs, in order to take shoes for them, would need to value the shoes above the eggs. The owner of the eggs would need to value uh, the shoes above the eggs. Uh, I hope I didn't repeat it the same way, it uh, should be reversed. 
Okay. Now, but again and again, uh, the owner of one of the goods uh, might find that the party whose good he desired didn't desire what he had. So that would occur again and again. So imagine I have a raft, and what I want is a plow. You've got the plow. You don't want my raft. Well, what could I do? Well, I would be willing to, if I could find out what it was you did want, uh, maybe what you want is uh, uh, some urns, or maybe you want uh, 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 some uh, uh, armor, or whatever it might be, uh, something that I perhaps, I, that I didn't have and didn't want, but I would be willing to exchange what I had for uh, something that you did want. Because once I got what you did want, then I would have the means of offering you uh, what you wanted, and I could get from you what I wanted. So if the owner of the, of the plow is willing to take uh, some urns or whatever, or a quantity of wine, even though I don't want the wine or the urns, I'll be glad to take them uh, for my raft as the means of getting the plow from you. Now, when people start behaving in this way, exchanging what they have uh, for things that they themselves don't want, but which others do want to have the things they want, uh, that is a process of indirect exchange. Instead of the, uh, the direct exchange of one good for another, and, the, and it ends there, uh, people are willing to exchange what they have for other goods uh, in a process of indirect exchange, which they then re-exchange uh, with the party who has what they want. Now, uh, uh, certain goods early on uh, came to be selected as media of exchange, as goods uh, more, or more, more or less frequently used uh, to effect further exchanges. And there's a kind of process of natural selection, what sorts of things uh, would be singled out as uh, more or less widely sought uh, in order to be re-exchanged for the things people wanted. Uh, at different times, in uh, different locations, in different historical eras, uh, different things have served as media of exchange. Uh, in a society of nomads, well, uh, practically every nomad would like uh, additional cattle or sheep. So if there's something uh, you would want to obtain from a nomad, uh, cattle or sheep would be a reasonable medium of exchange. If there's anything they have, uh, you're more likely to be able to get it from them voluntarily if you would offer them uh, cattle or sheep, depending on what type of nomad they are. Uh, at other times, uh, cow hides and sheep skins uh, have served as media of exchange. Uh, uh, various metals have served as media of exchange. Not just the precious metals, but uh, iron, copper. Uh, beads have served as a medium of exchange. The American Indians uh, were using wampum uh, in that same period. Uh, tobacco uh, sometimes served as a medium of exchange. Uh, there can be a, a wide variety of things that at one time or another served as media of exchange. Now, uh, what would be suited as a medium of exchange is the kind of thing uh, that was easier to re-exchange than what you started with. Uh, there are some things that relatively few people want or don't want very often. Uh, there are other things that more people want more often. And other things being equal, if you can exchange whatever it is you have for something that is more widely and more frequently desired as an ordinary commodity, uh, your odds of getting what you do want are uh, substantially increased. Now to fast forward this uh, to say 55 years ago or thereabouts, 60 years ago, uh, in the aftermath of World War II uh, there were places where uh, the normal conventional monies had broken down uh, through hyperinflation and in that uh, environment uh, in some places, cigarettes emerged as a kind of quasi-money. And that was uh, a perfectly reasonable development. And uh, seeing why that happened uh, sheds light on the process of the development of money. So imagine uh, that you were living, let's say, uh, in Germany perhaps, or any other country uh, that had suffered major uh, wartime devastation. They, of course, were the responsible parties for it. But uh, suppose here you are, uh, what you possess 
is uh, some old typewriter. What you want to get is some kind of medication. Well, how many people do you think uh, would possess the medication you're seeking <coughs> and at the same time uh, desire your old typewriter? No. I don't think that's uh, uh, very likely to happen. Well, you'd be looking long and hard. But uh, how many people uh, do you think who might possess the medication, uh, instead of taking your old typewriter from you, might be willing to take cigarettes, perhaps because they were smokers? That would be more reasonable. Now, at that time, uh, the proportion of the population that smoked was probably substantially greater than it is today. So suppose uh, you're in an environment, uh, there's some substantial portion of the population that has a regular uh, recurring desire for cigarettes. Uh, maybe it's 40% of the adult population, some substantial percentage. Well, if you can exchange whatever it is you have for cigarettes, your odds of finding what it is you want are much, much greater because there's so many people who smoke and want to uh, smoke the cigarettes you have. And so uh, you'd be much more likely to be able to get the thing you wanted uh, by first exchanging whatever you had for cigarettes. Now, uh, notice what would give cigarettes uh, uh, this kind of role is the fact they're very widely desired. Uh, they have a reasonable period in which they, they keep their, uh, their quality. You don't have to uh, re-exchange them right away. You might be able to keep them for some weeks or even months and still be able to re-exchange them. So uh, they would be uh, a logical candidate to accept as a medium of exchange. Well, what happens as some significant number of people start to do this based on the fact that there is this large number of smokers with whom they can re-exchange the cigarettes uh, likely for what they want? Well, now what has happened to the number of people prepared to accept cigarettes in exchange for what they have? Pardon me? Well, I'm asking what's happened to the number of people who are prepared to accept cigarettes. It's increased. Uh, the initial core group is the smokers. But now there's a second group added on, the people who are taking cigarettes not because they want to smoke them, but because they hope to re-exchange them with the smokers. So we've now got a larger number of people prepared to take cigarettes than we had initially. This further number has been added on to the initial core group of smokers. So instead of there being perhaps 40% of the population willing to accept cigarettes in exchange, now there's a somewhat larger percentage. Maybe it's 45%. Well, how is this a greater uh, preponderance of people willing to accept cigarettes? How will that affect the uh, reasonableness, reasonableness of still other people being willing to accept cigarettes in exchange for what they have? They'll want it because now it's still easier to re-exchange cigarettes. You've got the initial core group plus that further group, and now we add on this still further group. Well, where does this uh, end? If we have a situation, uh, there's a growing number of takers based on a substantial initial core group. The more the takers, uh, the more desirable the item is for use as a medium of exchange. Yes? I'm saying it only work that provided you, you, you could limit the supply of cigarettes or the production of cigarettes, because you can. Well, well, that's uh, another issue, but uh, let's suppose uh, there's nothing going on that will disrupt the usability of cigarettes. Uh, let's suppose uh, there's nothing that's going to uh, working along those lines. Uh, here we are now, we're up to 45 or 50 percent of the population is ready to take cigarettes. Uh, there's the core group of 40 percent perhaps, there's now a further 10 percent. Uh, what's the likelihood? of yet more people being willing to take cigarettes given there's this many more who take it from them. Okay, that will tend to increase and where will this tend to, to go? And how far would it go? Well, but how many, uh, putting aside the development of yet another medium, uh, how many people could we expect ultimately uh, everyone, uh, cigarettes uh, w would be tending uh, to become established as money. Uh, the larger the proportion of the population willing to accept cigarettes, the more desirable they become as a means of further exchange, which tends to increase the number of takers. And the ultimate stopping point would be when everybody would take cigarettes. 
Now at that point, uh, if this went on for a time, uh, people might think, yeah, well, we're all taking cigarettes because we all take cigarettes, but that isn't how it happened. It built up on the foundation of a core group that was taking cigarettes to smoke. And then there were enough of them uh, to make it easy to re-exchange, and uh, that's where it built up from. Now, uh, in this process, it would be possible uh, for further developments to occur uh, that might seem surprising, but uh, are fully understandable. Uh, first, you should already understand that non-smokers uh, would be willing to accept cigarettes. Why would non-smokers be willing to accept cigarettes? For re-exchange. Re Not that they need to smoke them themselves, but uh, there are enough people who do want to smoke them uh, that they can exchange them with them. Now, uh, someone mentioned, well, suppose the supply of cigarettes were sharply increased. Uh, conceivably, that could stop their development as money. Uh, maybe that's what did it. But let's imagine the supply of cigarettes could not be sharply increased. But now what's happening to the demand for cigarettes? We initially start out, the demand for cigarettes rests on the desire to smoke them. But now we're adding an additional demand, the demand for cigarettes as a medium of exchange. We've got two components of the demand for cigarettes, and that uh, demand as a medium of exchange is getting larger. So what should we expect that to do to the exchange value of cigarettes? It should increase it. And uh, Mr. Rosendahl? Yeah, I, I know this is a hypothetical situation, but I, I would imagine it applied somewhere in the past. You still have to obtain the cigarettes with something. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So there was still some other form of exchange, something else that had value to obtain the cigarettes to begin with. Oh, sure. Uh, you're bothering, and I started the example off, I suppose you have your old typewriter. That's an asset of some kind, and other people would have other things. The farmers are growing some crops, uh, <coughs> but uh, you, you, you don't find uh, that many people who want uh, most goods. Uh, something like cigarettes is widely desired, and other things, of course, have to exist to be exchanged against them or against each other. Yes, uh, Ms. Yang? Yeah, um, let's say that they do take tobacco. Uh, tobacco as um, a medium exchange at that time. Yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't everyone be making tobacco like rather than producing? <laughs> well, that could happen, and maybe uh, that would that could interfere with the process. But what I want to ask you to do uh, for a moment is imagine that uh, as the demand for cigarettes goes up, uh, suppose the supply could not be correspondingly increased. Oh. What would happen uh, to the value of cigarettes? It would increase. So the value would become higher uh, based on an adi this additional demand uh, for cigarettes as a medium of exchange. And if that couldn't be accompanied by a corresponding increase in supply, the value would go up. Now, the reason I want you to consider this for a moment is that uh, to the degree that this would happen, uh, how might it affect the behavior of smokers? Tend to stop yeah, they would tend uh, <laughs> to reduce their smoking because huh. they'd literally be smoking money. Right. So uh, you get uh, two developments. Uh, first, uh, people become eager to take the thing who don't want to use it for any personal purpose. They just want to re-exchange it. And then uh, the actual physical use may become uh, very limited or conceivably uh, could cease altogether because it's too valuable to use now uh, for its original purpose. Huh. Yes, uh, Mr. Uh, Weatherford. Weatherford. We're, we're sitting here talking about the value of cigarettes and what would happen if everybody could produce their own cigarettes. Yeah. It isn't a fact that we just change the story right around the money here in America today. We are in, indeed, although none of us has a printing press, yeah. creating money by our work. That as we work, as we increase productivity, as we sell more goods, we're forcing the government to create more money. Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Weatherford is saying, isn't it the case that everyone is, in some sense, creating money because they're all attempting to work and produce 